Hi everyone, it's Pete here from the Plain Talk Kit and a very good morning to everyone. And uh, today I'm doing uh, an interview with two guys from Wales. Uh, we've got Luke Davis and we've got uh, Paul Cambridge. Uh, good morning to you guys. Good morning. Hey Pete, how you doing? Yeah, well, thanks very much. I'm good, thank you very much for asking them all. I'm just checking, hang on a minute. Yeah, I've got a good pulse, I'm all right. Listen, um, I've known you guys, uh, I've met you a couple of times now and uh, I've been following you on, on what you do in, in so, uh, on social media and the uh, videos that you've been posting, you know. And uh, a couple of years ago, you it really grabbed my attention because, to be honest with you, I didn't know you was, um, you was chiropractors. I, and uh, to me, I just thought you was like some sort of physio dudes, like, you know, doing your stuff. And But what you was doing was, um, to me, for me anyway, looking at it from an outside, you was making movement sort of in, in, exciting to do like you know because um for me sometimes you know back in the day when i was sort of seeing physios and people like that i was sort of do 10 of these 10 of these 10 of them 50 and you know it, it's bloody boring like you know but you seem to make getting active and um stretching and all this sort of business and movement fun so but look let's wind it, rewind it a little bit can you tell me a little bit can you tell the audience a little bit about yourselves and what you do and where you come from etc etc cool yeah my, i'm luke and um i'm a chiropractor and um well basically met paul when i first when i graduated and moved to london uh, and we worked in a chiropractic clinic we both graduated at a similar time from two different institutes um one in wales one in uh, Oxford yeah. um, and we both gravitated towards the same gym in London because there seemed to be um, a, a movement focus it was in a gym and these were some of the things that we felt were, were quite important to get people moving and more physically active and on the road towards helping themselves um, and it was a little bit of a different perspective from the chiropractic models we were both a little bit frustrated with our education coming through um, quite a reductionist biomechanical approach to um to both movement and pain and we were working in london together for about six nine months piecing together education was important movement's important stress physiology is important sleep all of these things and um ultimately um figured out that it just wasn't possible to make these changes in the time frames and in the, in the model and the context that we were working in in London. So um, Paul went to Essex and worked with a influential celebrity on creating online fitness programs for, um, for females to follow. And I came back to Wales and created a, a company called Back to Roots, which has um, really been really been really influenced by those early conversations between me and Paul about our frustrations within chiropractic mm -hmm. to try and get across the things that help people change their behavior, which includes more time. It includes individualizing the process, it includes an active approach, understanding movement. And that's really what you've seen online, which has evolved in the last few years. And it's now much more than just me and Paul. We are, um, we're in, I'm still in full-time practice here in Wales. Paul's, full-time education in the chiropractic curriculum in South Wales. Um, and we've got a mentorship program so that it's, we're trying to reach more clients or more people in pain than the bottleneck that I would be just on my own. And so now when people graduate from chiropractic in University of South Wales, we've got um, a franchise that's open now in um, Finland, in South Wales, and that's, our attempt at trying to reach more people with this approach or healthcare philosophy that our patients when we ask them to describe what we do they find it difficult they find they say are we physios are we trainers are we chiropractors and i think most people settle on trying to describe us as trainers which i'm comfortable with because it tells us that the active message has getting across um however they do know that if they need triage, reassurance, all the really clinical stuff, that's always where we start. And the quick, as quick as we can get to the things that can really influence people sticking with the important stuff like physical activity, that's where play and all the creative things that we do um, seems, to be, seems to be helping people engage and, and make people want to do these things. 
Can I, I want to come back to the play bit in a minute, but I'll tell you what, I want to always ask people, how do we get, how did the, um, the health industry, how did, um, how, how have we got into this pickle that, I call it a pickle or fog, where, you know, an amount of people we're paying isn't going down, it keeps going up and up and up. How do, how do we get to that? And where do you think, what do you think are the steps that a healthcare professional should be uh, making to just get us out of this fog or this pickle? Well, there, there are suggested guidelines um, that we should potentially be following, gearing towards self-management, biopsychosocial approach, and all the things that you would be probably bored talking about. Um, but there does seem to be a bit of a problem with, with that, and that's the, the implementation of the guidelines. So we, we know there's research right there that shows that a, a lot of practitioners are not doing this. And if you look at the guidelines, it's very gray. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about it and saying, okay, we, we should be doing this thing or that thing, but um, there's no real obvious recipe for how it should be done. And, and that's no surprise because if, if it is to be an individualized patient-centered approach, there isn't going to be a recipe. Um, the, the big things that I think Luke and I really were, became aware of is that, okay, so compliance and adherence are big, big problems to getting people towards an active care program and towards self-management. So I, I can't say that some of the funky stuff that you might see us do on social media is better than a walking program. Um, but if, if I was to put myself and a patient walking on social media, it probably wouldn't generate much interest. So, so we, we do, we'll always make it individualized and patient centered towards what, what the patient wants, but we, we do play around a little bit on social media to try and show, you know, this can be quite creative. It can be interesting. It can be fun. I think fun is massively underplayed. We, we, again, we know through research that if, if something's fun, people are more likely to do it. So, so compliance is a big problem. So, so we'll, we'll work hard to try and make this an interesting thing for people to do. Mm, I think that's the, uh, that's the thing, really. I just, well, from my point of view, I'll try and make uh, pain self-management interesting. Like, you know, yeah. if I'm on the website, I've got quizzes on there, I've got games, etc. Like, you know, I'm trying to make it, you know, it's, I don't know, do I, do I want to use that word sexy? I don't know. I do, it's, 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 a word, it's a word we use, and again, you're, you're right. It's, it's not just the, the movement, it's the education, it's the, the delivery of the whole session, the partnership that you're trying to, to build with a patient. You know, we, we, I, think it's, I almost think it's our job to try and make it a bit more interesting for people. See, I don't know what you just, did, you just said something there really interesting because um, I, uh, I mean, I was, I was trained by, um, when I, I don't know, I'm not self-trained, but I, when I worked in the NHS, I was trained by a um, like Stanford model. Uh, Stanford University model and uh, while I was there I did uh, my sitting gills in adult learning and uh, ed education and you know but when I um, when I actually uh, talked to a healthcare professional I did a talk last year in London I think there's about 80, uh, 80 people 80 healthcare professionals in the audience and I just said to them hands up uh, how many people here teach self-management and the hand went up like this you know not all, everyone and I said how many of you uh, have had any formal uh, education, you know, uh, you know, where you've gone and learn how to be an educator, and four hands went up. You know, and I think that's, I think that's the, that's the thing where a little bit we're stuck is that because they've got this um, uh, title, well, I'm a healthcare professional, but I think with us lot, it's about make being an educator, rather yes. than not so much as a. Um, uh, a healthcare professional so to me it's um how you get that message over and we could all think back to when we was kids at school when you're thinking you know the good teachers and the dodgy teachers you know the good teachers made it fun you know um i brought up a catholic and stuff like that and i'll tell you what there was no <laughs> there was no fun in that but uh you know being so here's a bible read it you know, stuff like that. See, to me, that's like as poor a poor uh, teacher. Yeah, it's, I, I completely agree there. I mean, I, I lecture at the University of South Wales, and uh, sometimes we have two or two and a half hour slots to do a lecture of so much material that you know, af after five minutes, it's it's pretty clear that the, the student's attention span is gone. It's yeah. very boring for me if I was just to deliver the, those kind of slides. Plus, we we live in an age now where, where the students can find out whatever the topic is. They can just go on YouTube. 
yeah. and they will get a really cool animation or video which which will do a far better job than what I could do as a lecturer so whenever whenever we do workshops or we do our CPD work it's, it's, it's very movement orientated we're trying to get the teaching points and our education points alongside some sort of playful game or movement it doesn't need to be movement we'll do storytelling games or narrative best based games I mean, if, if you want to be really boring about this, there's a guy called Professor John Ratty, and he's got a quote that I like to say to my students, and he says, the sit and learn model is dead. The idea of just sitting there for two hours and absorbing information, it, it, it doesn't really do anybody much good. But again, I feel it's our job and our responsibility. If we really want to get some information across, it's retained. We have to make it interesting in some way. And again, that's where we would... Uh, I don't want to overuse the word, but try and uh, create a playful approach to learning as well as to our rehabilitation. Mm. I know you uh, you showed before we uh, start when I'm recording, Luke. You showed us a like a board on um, what what you're doing. Like a uh, could you show the audience that that board? Yeah, I mean, just walk a little bit. Something okay. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, good. I can see that. Yeah. So this is this is something that we we developed because we found that we were trying to get i mean you used a metaphor i think that was before we went on camera of this concept of an iceberg underneath the surface and the tip above the surface of being pain or it could be weight loss or whatever it is that people want that little the tip of the iceberg with all these factors that sit underneath it and we found that we needed to develop some way of helping us tell stories to be able to get in the information across in the, what we call the report findings so i don't know if you've been to a chiropractor before if, You've had the, the, a session where you've been to see someone who gives you a diagnosis, tell you what's wrong with you, tell you how you can help yourself, what I, we as a healthcare professional can do to help you and how long it's going to take. And that's, that's really what we've developed with this, with this chalkboard is the toolbox, as we call it here, which is not that dissimilar to, to the toolbox that you've yeah. created, but yeah. it's all the factors that we know are important, you know, understand it. If we're going to be challenging and getting you to a point where you're going to be playing with a stick and moving in what we would call thoughtless, fearless, a thoughtless, fearless, relaxed way, we have to have dissociated tissue damage and pain implicitly so that you can have these phrases like hurt, there's legal harm, and all these things that we hear. Uh, and that takes time to be able to get that across, but it's important. Exercise and movement is probably what we're most well known for. Um, and we've got a big repertoire and library that we work hard to be able to keep that fresh. Relaxation, pacing, graded exposure, manual therapy, goal setting, all of these factors that are in that under the iceberg that people then see the tip that is someone moving, getting back to doing what it was that they want as the end of the program, maybe on social media. And we tried to do this in almost like the physiotherapy model where it's dropping sessions, one session at a go. And I, we've been, we've been under the pressure of KPIs and getting business models busy and certain clinics, treasure how fast they can get rid of patients to self-manage so that they're away from the, the healthcare professional and actually Paul, Paul talks a lot on our self-management um, presentation but that's a, quite a misinterpretation of what self-management is. Self-management is ironically a partnership but just used in a different way to what most people might um, associate with it but what I think is unique about our approaches, our background in, in, in personal training and movement is that we don't do drop-ins. We approach it like a personal training model where we do block packages. And that gets a bad name, particularly within chiropractic, because most people associate block packages with passive fix-me care. And that is something that we're very passionate against, but we tried to do the drop-in model and pay-as-you-go. That didn't seem to work either. So our, our approach and our clinical model is block packages to get people as fast as we can to self-management and beyond that point it looks a lot like personal training um so that's that's in a nutshell how we how we try to tackle this challenge in evidence base that us as healthcare professionals face how long is a block so we tried different ones and in an individualized process this can be flexible and change but we typically settle on a 12 session program which if you were to be with us twice a week would take you six weeks once a week would be three months which falls in line with some of the very well done research like the glad trial on getting people to that point of behavior change um, and because our packages as quickly as possible move towards 
self-efficacy, self-management and active care, we do do bigger programs, which are 24 sessions, which if twice a week is three months and that very quickly moves to looking a lot like personal training. Okay. But done as a healthcare professional to clinically reason and to be able to change things on, on the spin as we go. So just to wind things up, um, what would be your, um, so someone, someone who's uh, living with a long-term pain, they're watching this video now, what would be your, um, your take on message to them about pain self-management, what you do, etc. What would be your take on message? Well, a lot of a lot of people do self-manage that we would never see quite well. Um, th those are people who are just getting on with their lives quite well. But um, there are some very good practitioners out there that you can develop a partnership with. Um, that partnership with a healthcare professional seems to be the real key towards adherence of any self-management plan. So I, I would I would make sure that the, the patients holding their practitioner responsible. Um, I would encourage some sort of push towards an active plan that should be laid out based on their own individual goals. Um, and I would like to offer some sort of hope. I know you talk about acceptance and, and commitment therapy, and that's probably what, one of the big first steps for people living with a chronic pain condition. But I think some people think acceptance is, is an acceptance of all of the, the kind of bad things that I need, I need to address all, I need to just accept all these bad things that are going on now. And that's not necessarily the case. It's, you know, an acceptance of the, of the condition, but also that there are ways to still maintain your life and do things that you enjoy and you can still have fun in your life around this. Um, Luke and I say often that if, if, we can, if we can get somebody to do the things that they really enjoy in their life, um, but their pain doesn't change very much, um, over say a period of three months or a year, whatever that would be, we will take that. We, 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 we would say, see that as a very positive result. So, you know, ideally we, we might have some impact on their pain. It's, it's ultimately, it's gonna go up and down all the time anyway. But if we, if we can help our patient improve their empowerment, that they're doing the things in their life that have meaning for them, that they enjoy, and that we do think is possible, um, we will take that every single day of the week because I think we've had an impact on people's lives. So, so there is hope. Um, you know, if, if you can get a good practitioner to work with, and there are, there are many out there, then uh, there, is, there is that chance. But you know, as I say, a, a lot of people don't need to see a practitioner. A lot of, a lot of people are managing themselves very well and, um, and fair play to them. Yeah. I just, I just um, I'm not, a, I, I need to sort of say, I don't, I'm, I've never really got into the acceptance commitment therapy thought, sort of thing, you know. But what, for me, acceptance is uh, sort of accepting that pain's going to be with me for a, a period of time sort of thing. It's a bit of an unwanted passenger in me, in me car sort of thing, you know, or me van. I'm not rich enough to have a car. <laughs> so I've got me van, me white van. So to me, it's, it's going to be a bit of an unwanted passenger in me life sort of thing, you know, and I'll leave it at that really. I don't. I don't dig too, 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 you know, too thick and stuff like that. Listen, um, what about you, Luke? Have you got any sort of take-home messages, like one couple of sentences? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working every day in clinical practice, and one of the, one of the first things I say when I get to meet somebody is, is that I want you to feel like you can ask questions at any point, and I want you to be confident in the fact that I will say that I don't know the answer all the time, and, and I will also say that if you can take that both ways. You can go to someone who will give you a lot of certainty and give you lots of definitive answers. And that's probably somewhere you want to stay clear of. But what you do want to find is someone who's going to put you in the driver's seat and be able to support you to be able to make different decisions and use a healthcare professional who will facilitate that and, and guide that in different directions. And that could be anything from a medical doctor. They're very time constrained. So um, personal trainer, it could be a physio, it could be an osteopath, it could be a chiropractor. And not getting fixated on the professional title and finding that healthcare professional puts you in the driver's seat. I think that would be the message that I try and get across to my guys. Is there, I know you've got your hashtag up there, uh, B2R Health. Is there a website? Yeah, www.backtorootscommunity is our website. We've all got our own, um, we put a lot of our our ideas out on, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so anything underscore B2R. We've got Reese, who's a physio. We've got Bayliss, who is a personal trainer. We've got Nathan, who is a, a chiropractor. We've got a chap called Pertu, who is a chiropractor. We've got Paul, who's a researcher. We've got myself. So anyone, um, we are in the process of getting the, 
the B2R Health Central Hub, actually, that is just in creation. That'll be going out next week for all of that creative in one place. Um, but other than that, websites and, and our Instagram hubs. And final, final question. Where do you see uh, pain self-management going in the future? Oh, that, that's a great question, Pete. What, what I would like is some sort of blurring of the professional identities. So, you know, you, you made quite a big deal about the fact that, that we're chiropractors and, and you know, ultimately, if, if we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, if we're all being influenced by the same evidence guidelines, then there is this push towards a, a similar thing that we should be doing, patient-centered, individualized approach towards uh, self-management. So I, I would like to think that all of the professions can get onto the same page to really help patients do what it is they want to do. And, you know, forget about the titles, for, forget about, you know, these kind of outdated ideas of passive models of care and, and really start to take some responsibility and help the people that are in, in front of us. I, I have my slight doubts and concerns, you know, that it's, as we kind of brushed on earlier, is, is self, a lot of people see self-management as, as a threat to their business model. Um, so I, I would really like to kind of get over that, get everybody working from the same page and realizing you can still help a lot of people. You can still even make a living from that and be ethical. Um, but I, I would like to see much, much more self-management within education. Um, and I'd like to see much, much more self-management being developed with patients, which I think is being pretty poorly done at the minute. Okay. Luke, have you got anything to add or do you need a cup of tea? Uh, <laughs> need to blow my nose. This virus has got me. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, listen, guys, it's been uh, it's been good, um, been good uh, talking to you, interviewing and stuff like that. But don't uh, don't race off because I need I'll have a little chat with you after we stop recording. But just want to say thanks for um, I, really. I'm not bullshit. No, I was, I was bloody hell. I was um, Yeah, I'm gonna say. You know, I will tell you what. It's I like your approach. It's refreshing. It's exciting, you know. And all I'm going to say to you is just keep on doing what you're doing, you know. Pete, I really nice appreciate that. That's, um, yeah, appreciate important. that. Listen, you two guys have a good day. Look after yourself, Luke. Get that, uh, get some echinacea down you. Or this is what happens training. when you stop training and get ill. So keep training. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take care, guys. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Bye, there. Ciao.